than private property. Driving is different than traveling. The ones who've taken the law class know what I'm talking about. But then you want to be careful or else you get handcuffed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ezekiel, the book of the prophet Ezekiel. And let's go and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand your word, and I do pray that this would be a, a good and faithful preview that it might arouse curiosity. This book's got a lot of strange, very strange stuff in it, and I do pray that you'd help us to uh, maybe look at the tip of the iceberg. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the book of Ezekiel, at the end of his name, the E-L, that's uh, El Elohim, that's God. Daniel, Michael, Gabriel, the E-L at the end of their names, Israel, that's all God's name. So Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, the, the um, prophet before him chronologically, they're, they're like pairs. Uh, they're like prophetic pairs. Both of them <clears throat> were children of priests, so they could be a PK. Okay, they both prophesied of the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. They both suffered with the people. They both uh, revealed the apostasy of the priests and prophets of their day, and they both honored the words of God. So they're very uh, closely associated uh, the only difference is, okay, if you're in Ezekiel, go to, if you would, go to the end of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 52, so a few, just a couple pages back. Jeremiah 52, 28. Okay, remember that uh, Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, and it does appear, and I don't know if Trump's going to follow through with it, that he wants to make the American embassy in Jerusalem rather than Tel Aviv, and that's a real smack in the face of the Muslims. And so, you know, if he's going to do it, that's, good. that's going to be a good thing. But uh, Jeremiah 52, Jeremiah uh, is a guy that was in Judah for 40, four decades, 40, about 40-some 40 years. And he uh, warned the uh, Israelites about their impending doom, and uh, they didn't pay attention to him. And so while he's there, Babylon comes in and um, attacks them three times, three separate times, about five, six years apart. The third and final time, they surrounded a city with uh, their soldiers, the Babylon, the Iraqis, and would not let anybody go in, come out for 18 months, so obviously their food supply ran out, and that's how they got them. That's, hey, that's smart. That's better than uh, fighting and killing. The third, okay, that was three times. The first time they came in, uh, Jeremiah 52, verse 28. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar, he spells with an R here, carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,000 Jews and three and 20. So 3,023 3, the first time. That's when Daniel was taken in Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. The second time is verse 29. Uh, in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. That's when Ezekiel was taken. Ezekiel would have been in the middle class. Daniel would have been the rich, the hoi polloi, the tops. Okay, Ezekiel would have been in the middle class. That's when he was taken from his homeland to Iraq. And then the third time is in verse 30. In the 3 and 20th year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar Adon, the captain of the guard carried away captive of the Jews 745 persons. And then all the persons were 4,600. So if you total the three, that's the total. So 4,600 people uh, were taken from Judah to Iraq or Babylon. And we know the name of five of them. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Ezekiel. Okay, so those were guys that were taken over there. Ezekiel was like a prophet to that 4,600 minus Daniel and his buddies. So he was like a special chosen prophet to them. And because 
Uh, when you get to the end of a society, things go wacky. They really go goofy, really strange. Okay, and like somebody in New York saw these kids playing with what they thought was a soccer ball, was a ball, and it was like wrapped in a rag. And they investigated and found out it was the skull of a person. These kids were playing soccer with it. Okay, and uh, the bizarre things that we're seeing reported, just bizarre, used to be in the soap operas, but now soap operas are real life. Okay, Jerry Springer and all that, Sprunger, whatever the guy's name is. Okay, all that, Tommy Rot, that's, that's just um, strange stuff. And when you get to a society like this, you've got to do more bizarre things to get their attention. And so God, in order to get people's attention, will do more outrageous things to get their attention. For example, in Judges, remember the book of Judges? You have... Uh, it's, it was a time where they did that, which is right in their own eyes, so we call that secular humanism. At the end of the book of Judges, in Judges 19, a guy has his concubine. She wants to go back to see Papa. They go back to see Daddy, and then he's wanting to go home, and the dad, so the father-in-law said, no, I want you to stick around for another day. He did that. He did it again the second day. The third day, finally, he said, I'm leaving. And while he left, he had to take up, you know, For a night in a house, and a bunch of sodomites came around the house. And he said, well, we're not going to give you so-and-so, but you can have my concubine. So he gave her concubine, and they abused her all night long. She was dead. He gets up next morning. She's laying on the porch, you know, kicks her and says, let's go home. She's dead. Takes a knife, cuts her up in 12 pieces, puts her in a package, and sends it to the 12 tribes. One of them said, you guessed her, Chester. Okay, and uh, I mean, uh, heads, you, heads I win, tails you lose. But okay, that's a lot of bizarre things. But now, what did they do with that bizarre experience? Eleven of the tribes got together against one tribe, lost the first battle, lost the second battle, and finally won the third one. Then they felt sorry for them, and they said they don't have any girls to marry, so they had a Sadie Hawkins dance, they kidnapped some girls, and then they had some marriage. That's how Judges ends. Isn't that bizarre? And so Ezekiel is going to have some very bizarre things taking place, because when society sees what people see on television nowadays, you can't get their attention by natural things. You've got to really do some bizarre things to get their attention. And God will go to those extremes to try to reach people. Ezekiel has some bizarre, very bizarre events. Very strange events. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, it says, Be be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. And the reason why he writes that is because during the tribulation, it's going to be so bizarre worldwide. Angels appearing, walking all over the place. Demons walking all over the place. Uh, reptilians all over the place. And it's going to be so bizarre that the only way to get their attention is to do something bizarre. Okay, and that's why Ezekiel, when you read through Ezekiel, you'll start off reading or what are called visions of God. Okay, you'll see that in chapter 1, verse 1. I saw the visions of God. So verse 1, now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the 4th month, in the 5th day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were open. I think the heavens were open found seven times in the Bible. And he saw visions of God. And when you read down through those visions, you get down to verse 15 and 16, you, it looks like you're reading about a UFO. Got the wheels. And you know, what the, you know what the common saying is for that? The wheels? He's a big wheel. Get that out of the Bible. So in chapter 1, you have visions of God. Okay, and then it goes into chapter 2. And what does he have, he has to, Ezekiel do in chapter 2 and 3? He has them eat a book. Tasty. He eats a book, chapter 2 and 3. In chapter 4, he gets his Legos out. Okay, he gets his G.I. Joes out, and he goes publicly, and Lord said, lay on one side. I, don't, I, forget, I always forget the left or the right, okay, in chapter 4, 
So he's got his Legos out. He's playing with toys out in public because he's the, the known prophet. And he says, lay on your left side, verse 4, for 390 days. About as good as working for Nipsco. Okay, so lay on your left side. So what he's doing is he's not obviously doing it the whole time. But okay, let's say he's got a prophet, a ministry in the streets. And so he goes out there for three or four hours in the morning, three or four hours in the afternoon. And he's got his Legos, he's got his toys, and he's, and he's playing a little army. He's putting a siege around there, and he's laying on his left side looking at it. And when he gets time to make his meal, God says, oh, uh, <coughs> um, Ezekiel, you may not like this, but here's what you're going to use for fuel to cook your meal. What? Well, here's this buffalo chip. So he gets a crusty buffalo chip, or cow pie, or cow patty. He originally said man's, but the Lord Ezekiel said, oh, I don't know about that, Lord. He said, okay, try this buffalo chip. Can you imagine him cooking that? People saying, boy, what's the aroma we got here? And he says, cook your food with that. Why? Survival. People will do anything to survive. That's Ezekiel 4. Okay, and so he said, do that for 30, 90, 390 days on your left side and then switch sides. 40 days, do it on the right side. So over a year, every morning and afternoon, I don't know how often he did it, but every morning and afternoon or something like that, he went out and got his little Legos out and played the siege as an illustration. And when it's time to eat his meal, the buffalo chip throws it on the fire, cooks the meal, you know, kebabs or something like they have over in Israel. And, uh, and then gets to lay on his right side. I mean, he didn't even get a balance. You would have think 180 days one side, 180 days the other side. And it was 390 and 40. And it was a picture to Israel and to Judah. That's chapter 4. Okay, chapter 5 is he's splitting hairs. Chapter 8. There's a common saying, it's an old hole in the wall, or it's a little hole in the wall. Okay, it's a common saying. And he said, Ezekiel, I want you to go dig in this hole in this wall. And in chapter 8, verse 8, you'll see that he got, does that. So he digs through this plaster or whatever. And he says, go in there and look what's going on. And what does he do? He goes in there, verse 10, and he sees creeping things and abominable beasts portrayed on the wall. So some artist has gone in there and he's drawn Mickey Mouse and Pluto, and Minnie Mouse, and all these cartoon characters of unclean spirits. He said, now go in there and look and see what they're doing. And it has, uh, verse 11 and 12, the ancients, the ancients, that's the older people, verse 11, 70 older people with their Masonic hats, and their fez, and they got their orac, and they've got their motorcycles when they run through parades. Okay, and he said, look what they're doing. They're worshiping these things in the dark. Verse 12, secret society. That's what Ezekiel is uncovering. And then he says, keep looking and keep looking around. And in verse 3, you have a bunch of women praying for Tammuz. Tammuz was a mother-son worship. And then he said, watch this, in verse 16, look at that. In verse 16, Ezekiel, they worshiped the sun toward the east, so they had an Easter sunrise service. Worshiping toward the east. The sun god. The sun god, that's the Israeli two pyramids. That's the worship of the sun god. That's the sunburst. That's, uh, let's see, that's the Chrysler symbol, the sunburst. So we can go after them, right? We won't do that to the forts. That's, uh, that's some of the uh, insignias that cars have. That's like uh, the Alfa Romeo car. A cross on one side and a snake or a dragon eating a person on the other side. Who would put that for a symbol for a car? That's an Italian car. I mean, Italian, Catholic. I mean, you've got to see it. One of the most sinister things you'll see as far as the car thing. 
So Ezekiel is investigating in a hole in a wall about perverted elders. Of course, we know the world's gotten better and that hasn't happened anymore. Yeah. And when you start investigating that, you're dealing with spiritual warfare. Uh, verse 9, he witnesses the mark of God. Verse 10, he describes the cherubs. The cherubs are not angels, but they're angelic, I guess you could say. There's five of them originally. One is a man, one is an ox, one is an eagle, one's a lion, and then one is probably the reptilian, which would have been the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay, so that's chapter 10. So he describes that, and that's kind of strange. That's kind of out of our territory. Chapter 12, the Lord says, hey, take all your stuff and move it in front of everybody. So he's unpacking his house and going from place to place, moving. And what he's symbolizing is, you people are going to be nomads. He said, you're going you're gonna to take all your stuff, you're going to get kicked out of here. And you're going to Iraq. That's, that's what he's symbolizing. Chapter 13, he rails, he absolutely rails against the prophets of his day. I mean, the entire, and isn't it funny he picked chapter 13, or at least God picked chapter 13 for that? Okay, and so uh, chapter 13, verse 13, double negative, you have a hailstones and everything going on. So he is just railing on the prophets of his days. He was not invited to the ministerial association. Chapter 14 is one I want to come back to. Because he shows how people are deceived. How can a person honestly believe that Israel's a church? Ezekiel 14 shows how that happens. Uh, chapter 15, he has a very short chapter. It's about the vine tree. It's only got eight verses. The vine tree is where it all started. The vine tree is probably the tree of the knowledge of um, good and evil. That's probably what Eve ate from. And it's probably a grape. Okay, that'd be chapter 15. Chapter 16 and 23, he writes about two perverted girls. And he gets in... Eh, he kind of gets in detail how perverted they are. That's chapter 16. Chapter 18, he deals with Old Testament righteousness. Okay, some things how a person is declared righteous under the Old Testament covenant. Chapter 18, okay, and then in chapter 22, he believes in conspiracies. We'll look at that one just briefly. Chapter 22, there is a conspiracy. Conspiracy is what the talk radio don't want to talk about. Conspiracies. Rush Limbaugh will say, if you're conspiracy, conspiracy a theorist, you're a wacko, you're a nut. What is a conspiracy? It's nothing more than two or more people intending to commit a crime. What's so illogical about that? Okay, and Ezekiel was a conspiracy theorist. Um, my sister, now Mel Gibson, had a movie called Conspiracy Theory. Anybody see that? <laughs> my sister and her kids... Josh and David, they were watching that, and they said, that guy sounds like Uncle Dave. <laughs> and I watched the thing, and I said, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe that, too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, a conspiracy is a fact. It's not a theory. It's a fact. There are evil men that want to rule the world. It is a fact. There are evil men, more than one, that wants to destroy America. That's a fact. Okay, Ezekiel 22, verse 25. There is a conspiracy among her prophets. In the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and precious thing, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Okay, so there's a conspiracy of the prophets. Verse 25. Her priest have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. So their conspiracy amongst the preachers, the prophets, the college professors, the preachers all across this country, and their conspiracy is against this King James Bible. If you doubt that, you can write the letters, I can tell you what they're right, and then you can tell you what the response will be. 
And what is their problem? They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I have profaned among them. So they say, NIV, King James, same thing, no difference. That's a conspiracy. And so then that bleeds into politics, verse 27, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey, to shed blood, and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. That's the politician. Okay, and so he lays it around. He's same thing. We learn from history. We don't learn from history. And in that chapter uh, and back in chapter 18, Ezekiel said one of the solutions to help your economy is to uh, execute the death sentence on the bankers. Now, let's head it at the international banking part, the Fed. Okay, the Fed is where the whole thing is going on in our country. It's a private corporation. And Martin Luther used to teach this as far as that goes. The love of money is the root of all evil. And I have articles, if you want to read some of them, about uh, modern money mechanics. You can get it online, read it, discover how a loan is created out of thin air, and how the Fed uh, orders the Treasury to print the money. The Fed pays for the printing fee, which is three cents per document, three cents per dollar, per five, per ten, per twenty, per fifty, per hundred. Three cents per document. They pay for the printing fee, and then they get the document at face value. Anybody can make a living like that? And they ask them, how do you write the check? They said, we just make it up. National Geographic, 1991, I've got the article. I mean, and Ezekiel was exposing that of his day. But how many people know this today? Andrew Jackson was the last president that had a balanced budget. He was the seventh president. And he said, we're going to rout you bankers out. And uh, he, he almost got it done. And so that's Ezekiel 22. Uh, Ezekiel 23, I mentioned. Ezekiel 24, he mentioned scum. Called people scum. <laughs> you scumbags. Okay. <laughs> and then his wife dies of a stroke. In Ezekiel 24, and you know what the Lord says? Ezekiel, don't cry about it. He said, do not cry about this in public. He said, if you've got to cry, go privately. He said, but in public, you can't shed a tear for your wife. That's an unusual commission. That would have been hard. But again, he's at unusual times. Ezekiel 26 to 32 are seven chapters in a row that he... Uh, describes or writes about the devil, Antichrist, and his ilk. Seven chapters in a row, starting at chapter 26. And so you go to chapter 32. Chapter 28 is a common one, well known, about the, uh, as far as the devil uh, being a cherub and all those things. But he's got seven in a row. Why? Because that will be the character that uh, brings Israel down. In chapter 7, he has a valley of dry bones. The ankle bones connected to the knee bone. You know, and he goes on with that one. Okay, and you have two sticks in there. And the two sticks in chapter 37, he says, one stick is Israel, one stick is Judah. Get a Mormon Bible and look at their interpretation. One stick is a Bible, one stick is a Book of Mormon. <laughs> I mean, it's bizarre. That's 37. So these, these bones, these skeletons rise up in this valley and they're kind of dancing or whatever. And the Lord said that Israel's going to be resurrected. He uses bones as that. Ezekiel 38, 39 are well famous verses for prophecy. Gog and Magog. They are well known amongst prophecy teachers. Gog, that, what a name, and Magog. And then chapter 40 to 48, if you're tired or if you're not tired, you can't go to sleep at night, uh, read Ezekiel 40 to 48, you'll go to sleep within two chapters. It's about the millennial kingdom. It's very dry. 
But look, I find something very interesting in chapter 40 of 44 of Ezekiel, no, 45 of Ezekiel. I find this interesting. Sometimes in some of those boring parts of the Bible, the Lord will tuck an amazing truth. Ezekiel 45, verse 9. Okay, now if, if we're correct that Ezekiel 40 to 48 is describing the millennial kingdom, what occurs before the millennial kingdom but the tribulation time period? And so he says, stop doing something that you did in the tribulation. Chapter 45, verse 9, thus saith the Lord God, let us suffice you, O princes of Israel, remove violence and spoil and execute judgment and justice Take away your exactions from my people, saith the Lord God. Ye shall have just balances and just ephah and just bath and so forth. And that's the money. That's what they were doing. What's an exaction? It's a legal term. Okay, it's akin to extortion. An exaction is when you charge somebody a fee where they're not obligated to pay. But it's done as such a deception, people will pay it anyway. That's an exaction. That's almost all traffic tickets. Almost all of them. Uh, that's much that goes on in court. That's property taxes. That's an exaction. I'm not saying don't pay it because you'd have a big fight. <laughs> but um, that's, um, it's just in almost every realm of taxation is an exaction. And God tells them, stop that. Don't do that. Okay, and you uh, fly overseas, you're paying a tax to the United Nations. And we can't do a thing about it. Okay, that's an exaction. And that's theft. That's theft by God. But again, we can't do anything about it. I'd rather be the uh, victim than the perpetrator. Okay, and let's see. He's priest of the captivity. Back in chapter 1, verse 1. So we just came through that pretty quick. There are certain phrases found in Ezekiel. The word of the Lord is found 60 times. Okay, that's an advantage. If you have a computer program, you can type in phrase and run it. The word of the Lord is found 60 times. So Ezekiel was a fanatic about the Bible. Uh, and uh, the glory of the Lord is found 17 times. And the hand of the Lord is found seven. The hand of the Lord is an Old Testament phrase. Okay, where people say he had, God has his hand on that person. Okay, that's, that's fine, acceptable under the Old Testament covenant. You'll find it in chapter 1, verse 3. The hand of the Lord was there upon him. So that was, in, that was basically saying that God was blessing this man. He's using this man. He's using him to influence others. Okay, the hand of the Lord was upon him. Then you'll see it in chapter 3, verse 14. And this almost breaks it up in seven sections. 3, 14. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. 3, 22. The hand of the Lord was there upon me. Okay, chapter 8, verse 3. Now, I like chapter, chapter 8, verse 3. It would be a, a very interesting to fly, but you, you wouldn't get the peanuts. Uh, Ezekiel, being a Jewish man, under the Jewish custom, would have a, have a big, thick lock of hair, uh, generally like Samson or whatnot. And so, in this one, Ezekiel chapter 8... You'll see at the end of verse 1, the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. And then in 3, and he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. Wouldn't that be an interesting flight? Okay, it'd be like, like Mo and Curly where he tries to grab Curly. <laughs> you know, or... Uh, I mean, the guy's got a big bush ahead. He grabs him by the hair, pulls him straight up. And it says between heaven and earth, how high? I have no idea. Man, you talk about losing faith. You going to drop me? Look at that. The horizon came at eye level. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's flat. <laughs> I mean, he's looking all over the place. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what the Spirit would do under the Old Testament, where he'd actually pick a guy up. And move him, transport him. Nice way to travel. 
No lines, no security checks. Okay, but that, again, that's Old Testament doctrine. So that's what happened to Ezekiel. Okay, that's chapter 8. Chapter 33, verse 22 is another time. Chapter 37, verse 1, and chapter 40, verse 1. So chapter 40, verse 1, that goes right into the millennial kingdom. So it could be the divisions there. Now, there are certain, certain thoughts that you can come through. Again, I'm just giving a preview. He starts off with visions of God in chapter 1. Then he ends with the millennial temple in chapter 40 to 48. In chapter 8, he deals with the secrets of the elders, or maybe you could call it the protocols of the Zionist, which is a very sinister thing. And he deals with those ancients. But let's, if you would, look in chapter 14. And I'll show you the Bible explanation how somebody becomes deceived. Okay, this is how the process takes place. In chapter 14, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man. Now that's a common saying all through Ezekiel, son of man. That's generally a Jewish thing. The, um, Luke, in the epistle of Luke, he used that phrase a lot. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. And put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face, should I be inquired of at all by them. Okay, so these men have a preconceived idea. It is a belief in their heart. And they're going to Ezekiel to ask him, what do you think about this? Now, they have no intention to believe what God says. They want to just see if God is as smart as them to agree with them. So they have a preconceived idea, verse 3. And they came to Ezekiel, and then the Lord says, what are these guys here for, in common vernacular? Verse 4, therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of, of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the truth. No, he answers them according to their idols. Why? That's what they want to hear. This is how a man could come to the Bible with a preconceived idea, reading the Bible to see if it agrees with him, and God lets him find the verses to back up his theory. He says, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Repent! And turn yourselves from your idols. And turn away your faces from all your abominations. They're not going to do it. But he tells them anyway. For every one of the house of Israel, the stranger that sojourneth in the land, which separated himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And watch this. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Whoa, isn't that unusual? God himself got involved in a deception. Of this individual. Why? That's what the individual wanted. Now that gets that that should put a fear in our heart that when we approach the Bible, we should come to it with a clean slate. And when we discover, not if, but when we discover the Bible goes against some of our beliefs, then we should change our beliefs to match the Bible. If we get in the habit of changing the Bible by adding a word, subtracting a word, going to Greek, going to Hebrew, to make the Bible say, we want to say, God will let us continue in going down that path, and he will encourage us in our deception, because that's what we want. That's a dangerous thing, is it not? Several years ago, down at Rensselaer Tuck, you know, when I started some of, reading some of this Bible-believing viewpoint, I had a couple families leave because they got mad about it. And I knew a guy out in California that wrote a little book, The Danger of Ruckmanism. 
We call them hot dog heimers. Okay, and um, I wrote them. I wrote hot dog heimers. I said, Dr. Heimers. And I said, I have a friend that's in danger of Ruckmanism, meaning me. Would you please send your book to my other friend, because he's got a preacher that got into Ruckmanism. So he sent his book to my, the one that left our church. And so a couple, two, three months go by, and I come across his path, and I said, hey, did you get those things settled? He said, you know what? Yes. I got something in the mail. It really helped me. I said, you did good. I said, was it this book? He said, yeah. I said, I sent it. I had somebody send it to you. What did you do that for? I said, because if you want to be deceived, I just wanted to help you. His face just... Tag, you're it. And you see, God does that. And that's what, when we approach this Bible, we ought to come to this book with all sincerity and say, Lord, I want to know the truth in spite of myself. I've been taught this for a long time. For example, the idea of getting saved, same in the Old Testament, New Testament. It took me a while to get over that, to learn that. But when I read a commentary in Hebrews, oh, it all clicked. Now I see it. Now I see it. And that Bible just opened up. So, wow, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. But you see, that's what a, a Bible believer is somebody who will change their beliefs to match the Bible. Unfortunately, the standard operating procedure is a lot of people will change the vow to make it say what they wish it to say. And when they start doing that, the more regular they do that, then God says, well, they're going to keep going down that realm. We'll just help them along. And that's very dangerous. And the end result is they think Israel's the church. And that's down there. They've been going down that path for a long time. And that's kind of like the roadblock at the end. Okay, we'll stop there. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for your words you've given us. And Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to approach the Bible sincerely and honestly. And allow the Bible to correct our beliefs when we're wrong. And that we might be faithful to your words. In Jesus' name, amen.